Welcome everybody. This is the annual Monash University Central Clinical School Public Lecture. I'm Steve Jane, the Dean of the Subfaculty of Translational Medicine and Public Health at the Alfred Hospital. Firstly, I'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands, many lands on which we are all meeting uh, tonight, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, this is an annual lecture from the Central Clinical School and it's normally hosted by the head of the Central Clinical School who introduces our speaker. But this year, actually, it is the head of the Central Clinical School who's de delivering the lecture, the newly appointed head in March of this year, Terry O'Brien. And for that reason, I'm going to act as the MC and uh, to introduce Terry. So the session will in involve about a 40 minute talk from Terry and then we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, that people will be able to use a Q&A button down the bottom to lodge their questions anonymously if they prefer. And then I'll take a selection of these questions to ask Terry at the completion of the lecture. Um, for Zoom, uh, probably the best practice is to use the central view option at the top and then uh, click the fit to window and side by side option and then you'll be able to uh, watch uh, the slides and see Terry speaking and, and the questions as they come off. So with that, uh, any further delay, I'd like to introduce this year's Central Clinical School guest speaker. And as I mentioned, it is the head of the school, Professor Terry O'Brien. Uh, we're very fortunate actually to have Terry um, and I must take uh, credit for nominating him because I was very keen to hear him speak because he's one of uh, the world's leading experts in epilepsy. So Terry is the head of the Central Clinical School and he's also the director of Alfred Brain and the deputy director of research for Alfred Health. He's a neurologist and, uh, by training, but has expertise in clinical pharmacology and uh, particular expertise, as I mentioned, in epilepsy, but also neurodegenerative disease and a broad range of other aspects of neurology. Uh, Terry leads an enormous uh, translational group, um, over 160 uh, clinicians and scientific investigators who focus on many, many different aspects of neurology. And he's really transformed Alfred Hospital Neurology into one of the uh, leading clinical centers internationally, not to mention nationally. Uh, Terry has over 500 peer reviewed publications. He's a member of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. And as I said, one of Australia's foremost neuroscientists and it gives me uh, enormous pleasure to introduce Terry, whose topic today is sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Terry, thanks very much for your contribution. We look forward to hearing your lecture. Thanks very much, Steve, for that overly kind introduction. Thank you everybody for giving up your time this evening um, and, uh, to hear my lecture. Uh, I'm gonna to talk tonight about a, uh, a very tragic uh, but unfortunately not uncommon complication of epilepsy, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, or better known as SUDEP, and present some of the important research bench to bedside that we are undertaking in the Central Clinical School at Monash University to try and understand better why SUDEP happens and then to develop better ways to prevent this tragic um, outcome of epilepsy. I'm gonna start by sharing with you, um, with her parents' generous position, uh, permission, um, Lucia's story. The circumstances of Lucia's tragic death earlier this year are unfortunately very typical of what is experienced by at least 100 mainly young Australians each year, with devastating impacts for their family and friends and on our society more broadly. Lucia was a 13-year-old, healthy, developmentally normal, um, as you can see, very, uh, very joyful young woman. She had, did have a history of congenital heart disease as a baby, um, which she had, uh, had spontaneously overcome, didn't require surgical treatment, um, and, uh, and she was, uh, was, uh, was very, very healthy and, and active. Um, about three years ago, the mother started noticing brief episodes where, particularly in exposed to bright sunlight, she would have a, uh, a rest of her activity, her eyes would flicker briefly and her head would nod. Um, these, she mentioned these to her GP, um, and who and no diagnosis was made, um, not surprisingly, because uh, these, uh, these sort of events are often very difficult to diagnose when they um, are subtle, but in retrospect, almost certainly they were uh, uh, small epileptic seizures. Then on the 28th of March this year, she had a, uh, a single convulsive generalized tonic-clonic seizures in the context of a mild viral illness 
uh, and staying up late on electronic devices, as many of our kids are doing, uh, particularly in this, uh, in this time. Um, she was assessed by a paediatrician the next week um, who uh, uh, felt that not unreasonably this was a provoked seizure by her uh, staying up late at night. Uh, no further investigations or treatment was organised at the time, but she was advised to avoid excessive stream time and late nights. Um, the next week, her mother saw her playing on her iPad, talking to friends in bed, um, said good night and told her not to stay up late. And the next morning came to find her uh, face down in bed, cold purple, and not breathing. The ambulance was caused, but she called, but she could not be revived. Coroman investigated, um, a post-mortem uh, examination was done and the conclusion was an unsustained death. Uh, because of a, a family connection, um, I see his mo mother Anne sought me out and I had the opportunity to review the, uh, the coroner's report, um, autopsy and other circumstances. Um, and I had no doubt that uh, the C had suffered a SUDEP and would fit in the category of what we call definite SUDEP plus. And I'll, uh, explain this more in my later part of my talk. So just to step back and give a bit of background about epilepsy and what it is. Epilepsy is an ancient disease. It's been known to humanity since antiquity. The Greeks called it the sacred disease. And despite countless numbers of famous um, and ordinary people who have suffered from epilepsy over the millennia, few diseases have been so misunderstood or generated such fear, stigma and prejudice. Unfortunately, many of these attitudes towards people with epilepsy, although a lot better now, are still held too widely. It's a very common condition, um, and uh, it's uh, actually not just one disease, it's a whole collection of different diseases that have in common um, the, uh, the tendency to recurrent spontaneous seizures. It know, knows no age, racial, racial, social, gender, or geographic boundaries. Um, it is the most common serious chronic neurological condition worldwide, with a, a, the who, WHO recently estimating 50 million people worldwide currently affected by active epilepsy. Um, and uh, it's estimated about 150,000 people uh, in Australia are, have, currently have active epilepsy. Deloitte Economics um, this year issued a report uh, that estimated the total annual economic cost of epilepsy to the Australian economy was $12.3 billion. Epilepsy is more than just seizures. People with epilepsy common have, commonly have significant psychiatric and neurocognitive comorbidities, which along with the seizures result in major disability, psychosocial disabilities and stigma, as I've already mentioned. But one thing many people have not realized, and that includes people with epilepsy, the community, and also doctors, is that it is also a condition that uh, is associated with significantly increased mortality. People with epilepsy have a standardised mortality rate of three times that of the general population, which means that, that, that people with epilepsy are dying three times more commonly than other people of the same age and same sex, which is an astounding condition. Dowsing statistic, and this rate is even higher in people with drug resistant epilepsy. You can die from epilepsy from a whole variety of reasons. I mean, the obvious ones are as a direct effect of the seizure resulting in accidental injury, drowning and asphyxia, prolonged seizures, or otherwise known as status epilepticus, and also suicide related to mental health uh, comorbidities of epilepsy. But the most common cause of epilepsy related death is pseudep. People with epilepsy have up to a 40 times increased risk of dying suddenly than, uh, than people without epilepsy. And it particularly affects young people with a mean age of 35 years. Um, and this means that the impact of epilepsy, is, uh, of epilepsy deaths is disproportionately uh, uh, affects the community because there are such, so many years of life that should have been there that have been taken away by uh, the epilepsy related death. SUDEP is, is a very been considered a very mysterious condition, and for a long time there were there were many different definitions of what that actually means. But uh, since 2012, there's been a unified, internationally agreed definition of SUDEP, which subdivides it into various categories. 
What is called definite sue death is when there is a sudden, unexpected, witness or unwitnessed, non-traumatic or non-drowning death occurring, occurring in apparently benign circumstances um, in an individual with epilepsy with or without evidence procedure, uh, but without status effect, because in which a post-mortem has been performed, which does not reveal the cause of the death. Definite pseudet plus is uh, the same definition above, but there is a concomitant condition that may have contributed to the death. And that's what the condition that uh, Lucia would, uh, would best fit into, or the definition she best fit into. Then there's probable pseudet or uh, probable pseudet plus, which is the same definition, but in which that we are an autopsy has not been performed. Possible pseudet when there is another potentially competing cause of death. And then near SUDAP, where there's been a resuscitation, so the, the person survives for more than an hour. But all of these together are classified as SUDAP. Why is it important? Um, it, as I've already mentioned, it's the commonest epilepsy related cause of premature death and the second leading neurological cause of, um, of lost patient years in the community behind stroke. Um, and considering how stroke, a, com a common stroke is, it just shows how, what an important and significant uh, condition suit is, despite the fact very few people know about it. It occurs, as I've mentioned, in otherwise healthy, commonly young people with few other reasons to die. Its incidence in people with well-controlled epilepsy has been estimated by a variety of epidemiological studies of between 0.4 and 2 per thousand patient years. In patients with drug-resistant epilepsy increases to almost 1% per year. And cumulative over 10 years, the risk is about 10%, which is, is similar to a uh, unruptured cerebral aneurysm, which most, uh, most people recognise as being a, a really very major risk for, uh, for death. It's estimated that about a, that at least 100 people per year die of SUDEP and more than 3,000 in the US. But this is almost certainly an underestimate. And this is a, a study that was published a couple of years ago, led by uh, Rosemary Pinelli who was actually my very first PhD student back in the 1990s when I first started working at the Alfred before I went elsewhere, who, uh, who uh, was working at the time for the Epilepsy Foundation. Since then, she has been a world leader in advocating and, uh, and researching for, for SUDEP, uh, and she was actually awarded the International Ambassador for Epilepsy Award um, in uh, 2011 for this. For this project, uh, Rosie went and uh, working with the, uh, the National Coroner's um, uh, uh, Information Service, um, sourced all the coroner's reports in the uh, ACT, a combined geographic uh, population over, uh, over more than a decade, um, and searched for all deaths where epilepsy or seizures were mentioned, either in the cause of death or in the, uh, the body of the uh, coroner's report. She found 70 five epilepsy related deaths after reviewing every one where epilepsy was mentioned. But in, in, of these, only 40% were epilepsy or seizures listed in the cause of death. So any ser epidemiological search for uh, epilepsy related death, um, if it didn't go through all the body report, would not have identified this as an epilepsy related death. She found that about 70% of these epilepsy related deaths fulfilled one of the uniform definition of SUDEP with 37 being definite pseudo. But again, um, only a minority of these were, uh, was, were identified as being pseudo in the cause of death. So really highlighting the underestimates of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of pseudo and epilepsy related um, death in, uh, in coroner statistics. Um, another um, similar story has just been published by our collaborators in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in New York University, uh, led by Oren Davinsky. Um, they looked at 220 SUDEP cases that were, after review of the, uh, the medical examiner's report, were agreed by a panel of experts to be SUDEP. And they found that only a third of them were was SUDEP listed as the uh, final cause of death. And this was particularly low when there was any potentially contributing uh, cause, such as uh, uh, or competing cause, such as uh, such as Lucia's um, uh, history of congenital heart disease. Uh, in those cases, the uh, examiner, uh, in many cases, um, went for the other cause rather than the SUDEP. And so, and 
epilepsy related deaths and epilepsy in general, um, as I've alluded to, are a major burden on, on, on the society of Australia, um, productivity wise and, uh, and cost wise. This is a study that's just been published, led by a, a really outstanding young neurologist and PhD student at Monash and Alfred, Emma Foster, um, in, uh, in collaboration with Ben Chen, who's a, a outstanding postdoctoral uh, biostician, who, biostician who works uh, jointly across the School of Public Health and uh, Central Clinical School, and, and uh, Bina Andani, who's a, uh, um, a researcher with uh, world-leading expertise in cost of, evaluating the cost of medical treatments and diseases. They, um, they did some lifetime time modelling um, with 2017 data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, National Health Survey and the World Bank. Um, and they modelled the productivity and mortality outcomes for working age Australians between 15 and 70. Um, they assumed that 70% of the cohort members achieved a seizure-free status, which is probably an optimistic assumption. Um, and they found that the costs of epilepsy in working age Australians were 14,000 excess deaths over the working years, um, with 78,000 years of life lost. Really uh, astounding statistics. Um, and productivity adjusted life years loss were almost 150,000. And a loss of GDP over that lifetime um, uh, of, uh, of $32 billion, Australian dollars. Importantly, they show, they model, that if you could improve um, the control of epilepsy by just 5% from, from a current baseline of 70, um, either by improved treatments or improved access to, uh, to uh, expert healthcare, you could save $53 million in direct, direct healthcare costs, prevent 811 excess deaths, save over the lifetime almost 4,000 years of life, um, and, uh, and, uh, and more than 17,000 productivity adjusted years life, uh, and $39 million to the GDP. So it just shows a bit of investment in improving epilepsy care and epilepsy research can really pay off to the community in a huge way. So how do we treat epilepsy? The mainstay of epilepsy treatment um, for uh, over 100 years has been what we now call anti-seizure medications or anti-epileptic drugs. And in a, lot, in a lot of ways, we have been fortunate in uh, the epilepsy field is we actually have had effective anti-seizure medications going back to the, the 1800s with the reduction of bromides. But it's really been the last two to three decades where there's been an explosion of new drugs uh, that have come on the market. Um, more than 12 drugs, um, over, new drugs over this time. And while they've improved our, um, our, uh, our, uh, our choice uh, and ability to find uh, a drug that, uh, that is uh, well tolerated to the patient, they have made very little impact, as I'll show in the next few slides, on the fundamental um, uh, control of epilepsy. Um, and none of them, are, they're all symptomatic treatments. So with none of them, do you have any disease modifying long-term effects. So if patients stop the medications or forget to take them as they often do, um, the patients are as likely to have a seizure as if they never took them in the first place. This is, uh, this is a very famous pie chart um, from uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Patrick Kwan, a very uh, PhD thesis. In fact, it was his, uh, his very first publication. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and he tells me that it's the most uh, quote, cited epilepsy paper ever. Hard, uh, hard first, uh, first innings to, uh, to, to live up to, um, but he's done many outstanding things since. Uh, so what he did is he, went and looked at uh, a cohort of patients in Glasgow who they had followed through their very detailed medical records, uh, their outcome after starting epilepsy treatment and newly diagnosed epilepsy. And about 47% of them developed, were able to achieve seizure control um, after the first, uh, first with the first epilepsy medication. Another 13% achieved seizure control with the second medication. But after that, you were really on a uh, curve of, of diminishing returns. And only another 4% obtained seizure control despite trying multiple different medications, leaving about a third of patients, 36%, continuing to have seizures. And this group of patients we call those with drug-resistant epilepsy. 
Patrick sent his PhD student then, now postdoc Ben Chen, who I mentioned earlier, um, and back to, and this is not unpublished now, it's uh, um, a jam in neurology, um, back to the, uh, the basement in, uh, in freezing Glasgow to repeat that, um, that experiment uh, in the era of this, this explosion of new antiepileptic drugs. And a quick flick, oops, back and forth between those two pie charts can really see that despite um, the multiple new drugs that are available, um, that, that red area of drug resistant uncontrolled epilepsy really hasn't changed. This is a, another graph from their uh, publication in JAMA Neurology, which shows that shift in time over between the two, uh, the two studies, um, where uh, the first generation drugs, carbamazepine, valparate, phenytoin in particular, um, were the main drugs in uh, Patrick's original study. Now there's a whole range of, uh, of second and third generation drugs that are predominant drugs used now. Um, but despite that, when you look at the portion of patients who achieve seizure freedom, it really does, has not changed one, one jot. And why is this important? Well, it's, it's, it's really, I teach all of our fellows and students that, you know, that what we need to be aiming in management of patients with epilepsy is seizure freedom, weight seizure freedom. And why is that? It's because patients who have, um, have seizure freedom, this is the most consistently um, demonstrated uh, factor to be associated with improved quality of life. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter whether that's medical treatment or in those with drug resistant epilepsy, surgical treatment, seizure freedom um, is the, uh, the most critical factor to this. And patients who have uncontrolled seizures, um, either through um, inadequate treatment or poor medication adherence, or because of drug resistant epilepsy more commonly, have an increased risk of injury greater medication burden with, uh, with uh, more adverse effects and financial cost, increased psychiatric comorbidities, socioeconomic disadvantage, um, reduced quality of life, and particularly relevant to this talk today, an increased instance of death, both accidental and from pseudep. So moving to the risk factors for pseudep, who is at more risk of having pseudep? And this has been, of having a pseudep, and this has been a really major area of research, both in our group and other groups over, over the last decade. And we now know a lot more than we used to. Firstly, and most importantly, drug resistant seizures, as I've mentioned, um, and particularly when those drug resistant seizures are convulsive, um, and particularly when those convulsive seizures occur at night, um, like in Lucia. They, they're the patients who have the, the biggest risk of, uh, of pseudep. Um, Patients who have inadequate treatment for their epilepsy, either because it's untreated or they have subtherapeutic anti-epileptic drugs or they're not taking their medications as prescribed, they also have an increased risk. Uh, people who live alone um, um, and particularly uh, sleep alone um, have a five times increased risk. Um, people who have a history of substance or alcohol abuse have an increased risk of suicide. Um, and in work that has just been done uh, by our group in collaboration with the other Epilepsy Melbourne centres, um, Austin, Cerise, Royal Melbourne, led by uh, um, uh, Jared Toe and uh, Clarissa Alversus, two, two outstanding medical students, have demonstrated that patients who have psychiatric comorbidities, which are about 40% of patients with drug resistant epilepsy do, also have an increased risk of SUDEP. So these are the patients we particularly need to be concerned of, but SUDEP can occur in anyone with epilepsy, and as Lucia's uh, a uh, sad story shows uh, can even be people with newly diagnosed or undiagnosed epilepsy. So why do people die from epilepsy? Um, this has also been a very active area of research uh, from our group and others. Um, there's basically three possibilities. Um, cardiac cause, um, where you have, the seizure is a very, very major stress, physiological stress uh, on the heart uh, and on the, uh, the, the body in general, as well as obviously the brain. Um, and if you've got an underlying um, vulnerability, either from a genetic tenopathy and uh, the, many of the same genes that control heart conductivity can also control uh, brain, um, brain uh, excitability. So the same gene abnormality that causes epilepsy can also make you more vulnerable to a, uh, a cardiac arrhythmia. And you have the stress of major st stress of a seizure on top of it, that can potentially trigger an arrhythmia in the same way that uh, sometimes people have a, uh, a fatal cardiac arrhythmia on the sporting field while exercising. Um, 
And the other side of it is that there's increasing evidence um, and our groups contributed to this both experimentally and also clinically that just having drug resistant epilepsy over years and the, uh, the, uh, the autonomic storm that occurs from repeated seizures uh, and probably also the, uh, the associated uh, um, effects of anti drugs and other things um, does lead to or can lead to an acquired cardiomyopathy, uh, which may then make you more vulnerable to uh, having a, uh, a, a fatal arrhythmia during the seizure. Second potential cause is uh, a primary respiratory cause um, and uh, airway obstruction or pulmonary edema uh, as a result of a seizure. Um, and the most common, uh, in favour of this, is the most common um, common um, uh, uh, position that people who are who have a SUDEP are, are found is face down in the pillow, like the procedure. Um, and this suggests that maybe they had some sort of obstruction um, from the position. And the third possibility um, is, uh, is that this is primarily a neurological death and that um, seizures, which are an, uh, not just an enormous uh, physiological stress to the heart, they're also an enormous stress to the brain with major excitotoxicity. Um, and afterwards, in many patients, you see a cerebral shutdown with a flattening of the, uh, the electroencephalographic activity. Um, and this potentially could cause a secondary cardiorespiratory arrest. And in fact, it's likely all three are involved, but the contributions may vary from one patient to another. Um, and the best direct evidence we have for the mechanism of the SUDEP comes from this study called Mortimus, um, which was a, uh, a, a Herculean international effort uh, where 160 video EEG monitoring units across Europe, Israel, Australia, and New Zealand, including our unit in rural Melbourne, um, pulled their experience from video EEG monitoring units. And for those who are not so familiar with the epilepsy field, a major cornerstone of, uh, of epilepsy, of the valuation of patients with drug resistant epilepsy is bringing them into a specialized unit in a hospital like the Alfred or Melbourne um, to, uh, to and bringing them off their medications and recording um, their seizure activity with the continuous EEG and, um, and, uh, um, and video as well as doing a, a, a raft of ancillary investigations such as ictospec neuropsychiatric evaluation. Very rarely, I mean, it's a very, very safe procedure and it's a specialized environment with 24-hour nursing care, but very occasionally patients do die during video EG monitoring. Um, and because they have the continuous monitoring, um, this was uh, potentially incredibly valuable in understanding what happens during the CDF. So they surveyed the, all of these 160 units and they found 16 cases where a SUDEP had occurred in the units, 11 while video EG monitoring was occurring. Um, nine, and there was also in addition nine cases of near SUDEP where resuscitation thankfully occurred. All of these followed a seizure um, and all occurred at night. Um, and, uh, um, and all for the completed SUDEX um, were following a generalized tonic chronic compulsive seizure. And, not, and seven of the nine of near SUDEX were following a convulsive seizure. And 14 of the 16 cases were in the prone position, which is lying face down on the pillow. And at least 50% of the medication had been withdrawn. So they looked at the pattern of the EEG and uh, respiratory activity when available and the cardiac activity. Um, and they found a, a very typical uh, pattern in, uh, in, in, in all of the cases. Starting with a seizure, uh, following this there, when the seizure finished, there was generalized cerebral shutdown with EEG flattening. And then secondly to that, you saw a, um, a decrease in or absence respiration and also cardiac slowing bradycardia. That then resulted in further hypoxia, which fed back to exacerbate the cerebral shutdown and ultimately resulting in a terminal apnea and then a terminal assisted. So this study really does suggest that um, at least in the cases there where, um, that were recorded in the video EG monitoring unit, um, that this was primarily a cerebral death with, uh, with uh, um, secondary effects on the respiratory and cardiac control. But there's is still plenty of evidence that, uh, that that may not be the whole story. And if, in some cases, uh, that it might actually be a primary cardiac event. 
Um, not all patients who experience CDEP have had a recent uh, generalised chronic, chronic seizure or, um, or evidence that they did have a, a generalised seizure. And CDEP may sometimes occur even between seizures. Um, patients with chronic epilepsy, there's increasing evidence they have uh, an increased rate of cardiac, electrophysiological and structural abnormalities, um, as I mentioned before. Uh, and as I also mentioned before, um, in genetic epilepsies, those same genetic mutations are often expressed in the heart and may result in a dual, dual heart and um, brain phenotype. And during seizures, you get this profound autonomic storm of aberrant, aberrant sympathetic and parasympathetic inputs. Um, which cause a major change in rhythm, rate, and function, uh, and potentially can trigger, can trigger a cardiac arrhythmia. And also potentially have a, effects, long-term effects on the heart in the same way that some extreme athletes can have, uh, uh, have significant uh, effects, long-term effects on their heart. Um, and there's a, a increasing body of clinical and, uh, and preclinical evidence supporting this. This is just one example of a study from, uh, from uh, the Netherlands um, where they looked at uh, ECGs in 185 patients with chronic drug resistant epilepsy and found uh, significant cardiac abnormalities on the ECG in up to 40%. This included atrial fibrillation, state rhythms, ST elevation, uh, and importantly, prolonged. QTC intervals, which predispose to malignant uh, ventricular tachycardias and fibrillation. And the longer you had epilepsy, uh, the more frequent you had generalized tonic chronic seizures, and having an acquired uh, etiology for your epilepsy all increased the risk of having a cardiac abnormality, all of which are risk factors for ZD. Another study from the same group in Holland found that uh, patients with epilepsy had a two to three times increased risk of a sudden cardiac arrest, um, uh, independent from, uh, from any seizure activity. So there does seem to be evidence of an increased cardiac pathology per se in people with epilepsy. This is another study where um, uh, the London group uh, implanted loop recorders in, uh, in patients, a small number of patients, um, 20 patients with uh, epilepsy. And these are prolonged cardiac ECG recordings that patients can wear around for, for years. Um, and they found that 21% four of the patients had a, uh, a significant um, cardiac abnormality, mainly bradycardias, um, but uh, um, that three out of four of them were potentially fatal and they required pacemakers. Um, Shobi Simpharatu, who, who was a PhD student with us at the uh, University of Melbourne and now is a postdoc with us, an outstanding postdoc with us, um, working in this area at, uh, at Monash and Alfred. Um, she, uh, she has replicated this as part of her PhD study um, and presented this uh, at the American Epilepsy Society last year. Um, and uh, of the 31 patients implanted um, and who had the long, long term recordings available, three out of the 31, so about 10%. Um, had a serious cardiac arrhythmia detected on the loop recorders, two of which were uh, sinus arrhythmia with ventricular asystole, and one was ventricular tachycardia. So it does seem that there is really, at least in patients with drug resistant epilepsy, there is significant evidence for, uh, for um, serious underlying risk of cardiac arrhythmias, even independent of seizures. Um, this is a recent uh, case report that uh, Shobi was involved in, but was led by uh, uh, outstanding, another outstanding medical student uh, of ours, Russell Nightscales, working with Piero Peruca. Um, and uh, it, they wrote up a case that we, uh, we monitored. It was a 43-year-old man who had a 21-year history of drug-resistant focal epilepsy with frequent convulsive seizures um, who had been admitted for video monitoring. Um, he had two convulsive seizures during the monitoring, and after the first one, it triggered uh, a 12-hour period of, uh, of post atrial fibrillation. 26 months later, this man was found dead in bed from CDEP. Um, and as it turns out, uh, other authors have also reported that, uh, that the presence of atrial fibrillation triggered by seizures um, is a, a potential risk factor for CDEP. And it may indicate that um, that, that these patients possibly have, um, uh, have underlying cardiac disease or another alternative is severe autonomic dysfunction uh, that could potentially put them at risk of uh, a fatal arrhythmia. And this was something that uh, Shobi uh, um, investigated as part of her PhD. We set up as, in our epilepsy program a, uh, 
a system where patients have continuous, as long with their continuous video EG monitoring, also have a full polysomnography on their last night of video monitoring, um, which has been incredibly important, both clinically demonstrating about 20% of patients have, uh, have uh, um, clinically significant uh, sleep disorder breathing, but it also, from a pathophysiological point of view and understanding cardiorespiratory changes before, during and after seizures um, uh, has, been, uh, has been invaluable. Um, and she examined uh, 157 seizures, 18 convulsive, 139 on convulsive from 70 consecutive patients um, who, had, uh, who were recorded with this. Um, and this, this graph here on the left shows uh, the mean heart rate before the seizure, very stable. During the seizure, you see a massive increase in heart rate, both in the convulsive and in the non-convulsive seizures. But in the patients who had non-convulsive seizures, that elevated heart rate persisted for at least five minutes after recording. Um, and the same thing with respiratory rate, you see an increase um, in the respiratory rate um, that was persistent for at least five minutes in the patients with convulsive seizures, indicating uh, a cardiorespiratory change. But most interesting, when she looked at heart rate variability, which is a, a, a really important measure of autonomic cardiac function, um, and, uh, um, and looked at patients who had what, we, uh, what I mentioned before was this post-ictal um, e generalized EEG brain suppression, which, which is when that, you have that generalized cerebral shutdown. She found that the heart rate variability was significantly elevated uh, in a sustained manner uh, for patients who had that post ictal brain shutdown um, compared to those who didn't have that shutdown, indicating the cerebral shutdown um, triggers this autonomic instability, um, which then can make people vulnerable to uh, cardiac respiratory arrest. In more recent work that we've done in collaboration with uh, Oren Davinsky, who I mentioned before, who is uh, the head of the uh, New York uh, um, University Epilepsy Center, um, is looking at, uh, at, uh, at whether heart rate variability could be a, um, a, a clinical, um, um, clinically useful biomarker of people at increased risk of SUDEC. Um, and this was a, uh, it's part of a much larger um, study. Um, it was a pilot study on 31 patients uh, initially um, who were admitted for video EG monitoring across a number of centres, including our centre, um, over about a decade. And so, who uh, subsequently died of SUDEP, comparing these with uh, 56 epilepsy controls who didn't desire SUDEP and 60 healthy controls. And it was a very simple uh, analysis looking at time frequency and, uh, and time domain analysis of components of uh, heart rate variability from just five minutes of interrectal EEG. And, uh, uh, and really importantly, um, if you looked at the, the awake um, uh, ECG, um, you see that the heart rate variability in the patients who died of SUDEP, uh, the epilepsy patients who died of SUDEP was significantly decreased compared to those who had epilepsy and didn't die of SUDEP, which was less than those who were the healthy controls. Uh, and this decreased heart rate variability is something that's also been, um, uh, been uh, uh, validated as a, uh, as a, uh, a, a risk biomarker in non-epileptic cardiac disease following myocardial impact infarction, heart failure, uh, and other, other cardiac pathologies. But this is the first time it has been uh, applied to uh, uh, prediction of SUDEP. Uh, this obviously needs to be validated and uh, refined in, uh, in larger studies, which is what we're applying for NIH, NIH grants at the moment. But uh, just with the data that we have, um, Ben Chen was able to do a model that showed where you, where you got a 1% uh, a incremental reduction in low failure um, low, low frequency um, power of the interrectal ECG, it corresponded to a 2.4% decrease in the latency of SUDEP. In other words, uh, a small reduction in low power, low power frequency um, was, was associated with uh, a sooner um, occurring SUDEP. So moving to cardiac ion channel mutations that could have cause the dual phenotype of epilepsy and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, many of the ion channels that are important in modulating brain function are also important in modulating cardiac function, particularly sodium channels, potassium channels, uh, T-type calcium channels, and, uh, um, and HCN channels. 
abnormalities in, in genetic mutations in any of these can result in long QT syndrome and uh, increased ventricular arrhythmias. An important study um, done in Sydney, led by Chris Sinsamarian at the University of Sydney, um, looked at, uh, and, and in the collaboration of Ingrid Sheffer from the Austin, looked at patients who had died of SUDEP, um, where they were able to get uh, genetic studies and found that about 10% of them carried a mutation in one of these genes. But what about the other side? This is where our group has been particularly interested in from our experimental work. Um, and that is um, the idea that uh, having epilepsy can result in a secondary change to your heart that might make you more vulnerable to suit it. Um, well, this is something that uh, is hard to explore in uh, cross-sectionally in the human populations. And this is where our little furry friends really uh, are incredibly helpful in advancing knowledge. And this work was led by um, Kim Powell, one of our, um, our research leaders, um, basic science research leaders. Um, and Kim, um, along with collaborators, we looked at two of the chronic epilepsy models that uh, we use for many of our, um, our epilepsy studies, looking at developing new drugs for epilepsy. Uh, one, which is a genetic model called, called GEARS, and the other, which is an acquired model of temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, a post-canic acid status epilepticus model where the animals have a period of status epilepticus and then uh, for several weeks start developing chronic drug resistant seizures, which are, are which uh, um, very closely resemble those that we see in patients with chronic temporal lobe epilepsy that's drug resistant. Um, and without bo boring you with too much detail, um, we looked at both, um, both recordings in freely moving rats in vivo and also took out the hearts and put them into an isolated uh, uh, fusion chamber in collaboration with uh, the Monash Institute of Pharmacology, where you remove all the synthetic and other inputs in the hearts, just look at what the intrinsic changes in the heart is. And you saw that uh, there was an increase in the uh, variability, beat-to-beat um, uh, -beat variability, very similar to what I showed in some of the, uh, the clinical studies before in, uh, in the animal models. Um, there was a prolonged QT interval, which predisposes to malignant cardiac arrhythmias, uh, and an increased ST interview, which also predisposes to cardiac arrhythmias. We looked at some of the molecular basis for this, um, and particularly focused on this HCN channel, but also looked at other channels, um, finding similar results. And this HCN2 channel, um, when we looked at the, uh, uh, at the heart, left atrium, right atrium, left ventricle, and right ventricle, the expression, uh, both with mRNA um, and also with, uh, with uh, um, protein, found that it was significantly decreased in the, um, in the epileptic uh, animals, um, which would uh, which have a significant effect on cardiac excitability and predisposed to cardiac arrhythmias. The group has taken this further, and uh, this is now the focus of uh, a PhD program project of one of our, uh, our students, uh, Janine Liu, and this work was done with the collaboration with Lee Delbridge from the uh, University of Melbourne where we looked um, serially um, following status epilepticus, um, pre-seizures pre two weeks after the status and 10 weeks after the status were now chronically epileptic with echocardiograms and subsequently, subsequently uh, post-mortem histology. And what you see is that there was a decrease in injection fraction that developed over time in the chronically epileptic rats, which most importantly had a, a direct relationship with the, uh, with the number of seizures per day that the animals expressed on, on prolonged video EG monitoring. So that the more, more seizures the animal is experiencing, the worse their injection fraction. Um, and then on post-mortem histology, we found that uh, the animals, particularly the animals that experienced um, a lot of seizures had this myocardial fibrosis. Um, and, uh, and this is consistent with the, uh, the uh, cardiomyopathy we saw on the echo and would predispose to, uh, the, and to cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, and it's consistent with a little bit of uh, post-mortem data that has been published in patients who have died of CDEP. And this is now obviously uh, subject to further research to see how we can try to protect the heart from developing these changes in chronic epilepsy. So at the present time, as science advances, what can we do to prevent CDEP? Well, the most important modifiable risk factor is to control seizures, particularly generalized tonic chronic seizures and particularly those that occur at night. As I mentioned in my introduction, that's the primary goal of epilepsy management, to achieve complete seizure control. We can do that 
um, with good medical treatment in 60 to 70 percent of people but many people never get good medical expert treatment and that's one of the challenges for the community in australia and certainly in the, in, in the developing world to try and deliver good quality medical care uh, and then to get patients to, uh, to understand the importance of adhering to their medications. Um, in patients with drug-resistant epilepsy, we have surgical treatment um, that um, can um, and really is the only realistic prospect for seizure freedom. Uh, and in ideal surgical candidates, we can achieve seizure freedom rates in 60 to 80%, but really only a, a small proportion of patients are suitable for epilepsy surgery or drug-resistant, which is why we need to develop medical treatments for uh, that are disease modifying for those that are not sort of surgery. And that's the topic of another talk um, another day. But does, what's the evidence that effective treatment does actually reduce the risk of death? Well, actually there's quite a lot of evidence and I'll outline some of it. So this is a really important study uh, led by Philip Ravon, who also led the Mortimer study that was published in Lancet Neurology a few years ago. And they did a pool data of, um, of uh, multiple um, uh, double blind randomized placebo control add on trials for uh, development of new anti epileptic drugs. And they showed that the, uh, the rate of SUDAP was significantly lower in patients who received an efficacious, do efficacious dose of anti epileptic drugs as part of this randomized control trial at a rate of 0.9 um, compared to a rate of 6.9 in those who were allocated for, for placebo, which is a confronting statistic, particularly for, for people who do. Uh, um, uh, randomized controlled trials of new drugs, which is one of our, um, our major pla platforms for developing new therapies. Um, there's also evidence that uh, if patients don't take their tablets properly, they have increased death rates. This is a really uh, interesting study done by Ed Fort in the US on the basis of Medi Medicare prescription data for over 30,000 patients um, that over uh, 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 three states in the US. They showed that during non-adherent periods, um, when they weren't taking their, their tablets properly, they had an increased rates of uh, ED visits, hospital admissions, and uh, most importantly, an increased risk of mortality. Um, there's no randomized controlled trials of epilepsy surgery that have uh, followed patients long enough to know if there's a decrease in death, so in, with class one evidence, but there is increasing observational evidence that's the case. This is a study from the uh, University College London um, group that showed that patients who uh, had drug resistant epilepsy who didn't go to surgery had uh, a, a, a rate of a death of, uh, of, of 40 out of 641 patients compared to 19 out of 300, uh, 561 patients. Uh, and importantly, patients who didn't achieve seizure freedom um, had a 4.9 times increased risk of death than those who did achieve seizure freedom. Neurostimulation is increasingly being offered um, as a new mode of treatment for patients who are not suitable for resective epilepsy surgery. This, in, this can involve vagal nerve stimulator, DBS and RNS. And there's evidence that patients who are treated with these therapies have decreased death rates. Um, other prevention methods, uh, methods of um, supervision at night I've mentioned. Um, there's a number of studies that have shown that uh, patients who, uh, who sleep with someone else or share a bed and have some sort of precaution such as listening device um, are, are uh, are less likely to die. Here's an outst outst a really astounding um, data for, that was just published this year from a, a large Swedish study, which showed that patients who shared a bedroom had a, a, a three times less, or who did not share a bedroom had a three times increased risk of SUDEP. Patients with generalized tonic chronic seizures had an 18 times increased risk of SUDEP. But if you had generalized tonic chronic seizures and you didn't, share a bedroom had a 67 times increased risk of seizure. Um, oxygen administration and repositioning after seizures as we often do in the monitoring unit um, may decrease death rate. Educating people who live with people with epilepsy, how to perform first aid procedures uh, is probably important. There's a number of devices in the market, all of which remain unproven at this stage. Um, but I think as important as anything is discuss SUDEP and its relationship to adequate treatment with patients and their families so they understand why it's really important to take those medications to control seizures. And this has been a very con controversial area amongst neurologists and medical practitioners. Uh, many people feel it's confronting to mention SUDEP to a patient with newly diagnosed epilepsy. Um, and so many surveys have shown that uh, few neurologists actually do discuss it with patients. 
But when you talk to patients and their families, and particularly those where a family has died from CDEC, they all say, or they, many of them say, they, they want this information. Uh, and families of CDEC victims are often very angry at not being told. Um, and, uh, and the UK guidelines now do recommend that all patients with epilepsy and their families be provided with information about sudden unexpected deaths so they can make informed decisions about their treatment. And there's a, a major effort in the community to uh, increase awareness, community awareness. I gave a medical student lecture earlier this week and I was astounded to know that of those 10 students from our university in third year, not one of them had heard of SUDEP. Last Friday, the 23rd of October was SUDEP Action Day. Um, led from the UK for a national day to raise awareness on CDEP. Um, the Epilepsy, Epilepsy Action in the UK um, and Epilepsy Action in Australia have, uh, have uh, now got this um, CDEP checklist that all health practitioners can use to identify and stratify patients by risk of CDEP. And the Epilepsy Foundation of Victoria have a lot of information about CDEP on their webpage and uh, uh, are doing a great job at raising awareness. So to finish, um, and just recap on the key points of my lecture, SUDEP is an important cause of premature death in people with epilepsy. The mechanisms likely involve a combination of central respiratory cardiac mechanisms. Um, the biggest risk factor is lack of, of seizure control, particularly nocturnal generalized convulsions. The incidence is likely to be reduced by effective medical or surgical treatment. And further research to identify biomarkers of individual risk and develop more effective preventative measures are urgently needed. And I believe it's incredibly important to discuss CDEP with patients and families um, and raise awareness in the community. So, uh, and it's only by this way that, uh, that we are able, able to, to get to, um, people to, uh, to, be, uh, to have, make informed choice about their, their epilepsy management um, and, uh, and effectively control their seizures and therefore reduce CDEP and raise more funds for research to understand it better. So just to finish by acknowledging the, the many people, I've mentioned many of these already, have collaborated, our, people, our group within, uh, within the Department of Neuroscience at Monash University collaborates in Baker uh, internationally and across Melbourne. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Terry, for that. Uh, it was a, a fantastic uh, talk about uh, an area a lot of us didn't know a lot about, but uh, um, I think uh, really eye-opening as to uh, some of the risks that you know patients with epilepsy suffer from in, in what is a very uh, prevalent condition within our uh, society. I want to finish by thanking uh, Shelley Ryland and Julia Veach who've done all the back of house work uh, advertising, putting uh, the whole uh, presentation together. So thank you very much to both of them. And uh, lastly, again, to thank Terry for a really uh, magnificent lecture uh, that I think has been uh, informative at so many levels for all of us. So please join me in thanking Terry very much. I'll clap on your behalf, but thanks again, Terry, much appreciated. Thanks very much, everyone, for your attendance. Have a great night. Thanks.